Our sermon text for this morning comes from the book of Luke, chapter 19, verses 11 through 27. It's the parable of the ten pounds. As they were listening to this, he went on to tell a parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. So he said, a nobleman went to a distant country to get royal power for himself and then return. He summoned 10 of his slaves and gave them 10 pounds and said to them, do business with these until I come back. But the citizens of his country hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to rule over us. When he returned, having received royal power, he ordered these slaves to whom he had given the money to be summoned so that he might find out what they had gained by trading. The first came forward and said, Lord, your pound has made 10 more pounds. He said to him, well done, good slave. Because you have been trustworthy in a very small thing, take charge of ten cities. Then the second came, saying, Lord, your pound has made five pounds. He said to him, and you rule over five cities. Then the other came saying, Lord, here is your pound. I wrapped it up in a piece of cloth, for I was afraid of you. Because you are a harsh man, you take what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. He said to him, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked slave. You knew, did you, that I was a harsh man, taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money into the bank? Then when I returned, I could have collected it with interest. He said to the bystanders, take the pound from him and give it to the one who has 10 pounds. And they said to him, Lord, he has 10 pounds. I tell you, to all those who have more will be given, but from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. But as for these enemies of mine, who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and slaughter them in my presence. Let us go to God in prayer. Gracious God, open our hearts this day. May we hear your word. May we have the courage to put your word into practice. Now and always. Amen. There was a professor who wanted to study the amazing ability that frogs possessed when it came to jumping. He decided to take a frog and see if jumping was some inherent ability in the brain or could a frog simply jump because it was the way their legs were made. So one day he put a frog on his lap table and he told the frog to jump. The frog leapt right off of the table. The professor then took the frog and immobilized one of its legs. You can decide what that means. That leg didn't work. 
The professor told the frog to jump and even with one leg not working, the frog leapt into the air. The professor re repeated the process two more times. Each time that a leg was immobilized and the frog was told to jump, it made every effort to jump. Finally, with all four immobilized legs, the professor said jump and the frog didn't move. Three times he told that frog to jump and three times it just laid there. The professor could only draw one conclusion and mobilize all four legs on a frog so it cannot use them in any way and that frog will go deaf. <laughs> That one takes a while. <laughs> Too often we act like the professor in our story. We only see things a certain way. Our focus is too narrow. We can draw the, long, the wrong conclusions and even with the best of intentions, we can do more harm than good. Today's scripture teaches us certain truths about life, provides an occasion for growth and an opportunity to broaden one's perspective. So let's take some time to look about this, this story about the king and his servants to see what it says to us today. It is chock a block full with things about life and things we can learn. The first thing this scripture demonstrates is that life involves trust. The king gave his servants money and then he departed so that they could be left alone to either triumph or fail. The world treats us in the same way. Our parents raise us. Our teachers educate us. We have friends that encourage us and people in life that guide and support us. Those key people can affect us. They can inspire us. They can impact our lives. They have great influence on who we are and who we will become. But ultimately, we ourselves must reach and make those life-changing decisions. What we do, where we live, who we marry, how we serve, what kind of mark or effect we will have and leave on this world. We are trusted to make decisions that will best serve our needs. And when we make those choices as Christians, we also have to remember that we're making choices on how we serve God, how we love our fellow human beings, and how we commit our very lives to the living Christ. All of this plays a key factor in who we are and how we live. In life, there is an element of trust in place, and that trust can lead to success or failure. The king in our parable trusted his servants to take his money, to be productive, and to earn him even more. He expected that they would make the right and apt choices. In our lives with Christ, the same is expected of us. God entrusts us to make choices that will demonstrate to this world God's love and forgiveness and mercy and grace. Second thing that we learn in this parable is that life teaches us that success equals responsibility. In our story, the two servants who pleased the master were rewarded. The one who increased his money tenfold was given ten cities to manage, and the one who increased fivefold was given five cities to manage. Now, the king could have said, wow, you've earned ten times what your money is worth. Go relax. Let your money work for you. Take a nice trip. You've earned it. Instead, the reward for all of his hard work was to give even more work and responsibility. That's how life works. If our children prove that they are responsible, we give them more to do, and ultimately we teach them independence. In school, each subsequent grade gets a little bit harder with more work to accomplish. The further you climb up the corporate ladder, the more responsibility you are given. If you are pleased with a company or a service, you refer that company to your friends, which generates more work and more business for that company. The highest compliment given is when you are entrusted with more responsibility and independence for the work that you do. The reward for a job well done is not less work in the future. The more we do, the more we are given to do. The third thing that this parable teaches is that the more we have, the more we are given, and the less we have, it will be taken away. 
The servant who did nothing with his money had it taken from him, and it was given to the servant who earned the most. Now this hardly seems fair. Why should the man with the least amount give his money to the man with the most amount? Those who have much will be given much. Those who have little will lose what they have. We know that to be true in life, but there's another aspect of this. If you train as an athlete and you condition your body to be fit and strong, then the more you train, the stronger and the more athletic you become. If you stop your training and your conditioning, uh, eventually your muscles will get weaker and you will lose that athletic body. That is one of those ironies of life. The more you practice at something, the better and more apt you become. And when you stop practicing, training, learning, something with that aptness goes away. There is no such thing as standing still in life. We either advance to greater heights or we slip back in our ability. Now this parable also raises a question in my mind. What did the servant who was punished, what did he do that was so terrible? He didn't waste the money he was given. He didn't drink it or gamble it away. He didn't earn money and lie about it, keeping all the profit for himself. He didn't do anything dishonest or illegal or, or even immoral. He simply decided to keep it safe in a cloth until his master's return. So here's the problem. He did nothing. The master trusted the servant to use his gifts and talents to be productive, to do something good with what he had been given. But he wasted those talents by failing to even try. One of the worst things we can do on our journey of life and on our journey of faith is to do nothing. God has given each of us wonderful skills and talents. And when we trust God with what God has given us, when we trust that God knows what is best for us, when we trust God, we grow further into God's kingdom. It is when we refuse to use God's given talents that failure takes place. It's okay to fail, but is it okay to never even try? God works in us every day so that we can do our best. He gives us trust and responsibility and commitment. It is our job to become the wonderful person God knows and wants us to be. Now the final piece about this scripture is that some scholars believe that this scripture is a parallel about Jesus' life and ministry. Jesus' parallel, let me do it this way. I have, I read in a commentary, in, in my life application study Bible, at the bottom, that it puts a commentary there. And this is what it says about this thought. Jesus' parable shows that his kingdom would not take this form right away. So first he would go away for a while and his followers would need to be faithful and productive in his absence. Upon his return, Jesus would inaugurate a kingdom more powerful than anyone's expectations. This story showed what Jesus' followers were to do during his time of departure and his return, or the second coming. The, this parable applies to us directly because we are living in that period of time. It teaches us to understand that we have been given excellent resources to build, expand, and grow God's kingdom. We are expected to multiply that kingdom. We should be taking our role as Christians seriously. We need to use our gifts to grow into what God knows. This is what we learn today. And that ends the quote. The world and our Christianity is about trust and responsibility and commitment and trying our best and doing our best with what we have been given. Heartaches and failures will happen and so we will fail and we will try and we will keep moving forward and we will do our best. And the story I want to tell you today comes from Paul Harvey. Most of you may know, I'm seeing smiles. I used to love to listen to Paul Harvey. When I was about 18, I worked for a flower company. I used to deliver flowers after school and on weekends. And I would turn the radio station to the AM dial and I would get Paul Harvey and his rest of the story. 
They would take true things, true actions about famous people or events, and he would tell you the unknown facts behind them. And he would, and he would always end his thing by saying, and now you know the rest, and he paused of the story, good day, and then it would fade to something immensely popular. Uh, let me see if I get my memory right from the book I got it from. He was syndicated in over 1,400 radio stations, 110 television stations, and 300 newspapers. People love to hear. So this today is one of those stories. It's about a little boy named Elias. I can't call him Bobby because it's a true story. And so I have to go with what it says in the book. So Elias was a little boy. He grew up in the city. His father worked in construction. And when he was four, they moved from Chicago to a farm in Missouri. And the important part about Elias happened when he was on that farm and he was about seven years old. It was a beautiful fall day. His father was doing chores around the farm. His mother was in the house, probably baking a pie. I don't know what you do in a farm, but they were busy. And Elias had the opportunity to go and play. And he had a favorite spot. There was an apple orchard on the other side of the farm. And he used to love to go to that orchard and use his imagination and play and get shade and climb the trees and run between the rows. And that's what he was doing. And he, as he was playing, he came across on a very, very low branch of that apple tree. He came across an owl that was sleeping. And it was the most beautiful thing that he had seen. And he wanted that owl as a pet. Because he could take care of it in, in his room and it wouldn't have to live outdoors in the snow and the rain and whatever else it does in Missouri and, and weather-wise. And so if he could just sneak up on it and get it, he could take it home and they could be friends and he could give it a great life. So he sneaks up as quiet as could be, trying not to crunch too hard on the leaves, trying not to walk too hard on the twigs breaking them and he gets right up to that owl and he reaches out and he grabs the leg and of course we all know what happens when you grab a sleeping owl it started to it it, it jumped awake and it started to screech and yell and shirk and scream and feathers were flying everywhere and and the, and the owl was going wild and crazy and the more it made a commotion, the more scared Elias became, and he couldn't let go of that owl. And in the fit of everything, and in the adrenaline of the moment, and in everything that happened, in, a, in one feet, he takes the owl and he slams it on the ground. And he takes the life out of this little owl. And once it's all over and he sees what he's done, he begins to cry. And then he does what every single one of us would have done. He looks around, he sees that nobody saw, and he runs away. But he comes back. He comes back a little while later, and he buries the owl and gives it a nice burial and doesn't tell his parents what he did or what happened. But this is a Paul Harvey story, so there has to be the rest of the story. And the rest of the story is that that incident so changed that little boy's life. And I'm sitting here now wondering how many of you know what I'm going to say and how many of you are curious as what I'm going to say. But that incident so changed that little boy's life. He never again killed another living thing in his entire life. He used his God-given talents in life, figured out what they were, and used them to bring hope and joy and to teach people about animals, about how to respect animals. He had that trust, he had that responsibility, he had that commitment, and he went out in the world and showed it. And he showed it because of that incident in his life. And he became well known. Well, he'd have to, it's a Paul Harvey story. So he became well known. Because of that incident, he used his talents to make this world a better place. That was the life-changing moment for Elias, for, here it comes, for Walter Elias Disney. And apparently that was the inspiration be behind who Walt 
came. Every time I tell that story, people ask me if it's true or not. It's Paul Harvey. It's true for me. And it's a wonderful story of inspiration to relate to all of us this day. God wants us to do our best. God wants us to use our talents, our skills, to commit, to be responsible, to trust one another. And when we do that and trust God's plan, we can do amazing things in this world. And we can make this world a better place because we will start to make this world God's place. Let us pray. Gracious God, be with us all. Help us to commit our lives to you and do what we do, now and forever. Amen.